Hi, good evening. I'm Lonnie Stonich, the executive director of FAN. We're a nonprofit that presents programming exploring human development across the lifespan. I'm honored to welcome you to tonight's conversation between Melissa Blitz, Joe Sirio, and Tiffany Myers. Thanks for joining us tonight. We're broadcasting for a second night now in a row from our homes because our office is simply too cold to work in. Um, FAN's YouTube channel has an archive of over 300 videos of past events, so be sure to subscribe to our channel to get updates when new recordings are posted. And now for some introductions. Melissa Blitz is a licensed clinical professional counselor and the associate director of the Center for Excellent, of Excellence for mood, Adult Mood and Anxiety Programming at Compass Health Center. She has worked in various settings spanning inpatient care, community mental health, clinical research, and intensive outpatient and partial hospitalization programs. Melissa identifies as a member of the LGBTQ plus community and has worked with hundreds of patients who identify as LGBTQ plus during her tenure at Compass. Joe Sirio is the Chief Clinical Quality Officer at Compass Health Center. He is a licensed clinical professional counselor as well and is trained in Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, ACT, Dialectical Behavior Therapy, DBT, Cognitive Behavior Therapy, CBT, and Exposure Therapy. Sirio has worked in community mental health and inpatient, I should call you Joe. Joe worked, sorry about that typo. Joe worked in community mental health and inpatient before joining Compass in 2018. As a proud member of the LGBTQ plus community, he is a long-standing advocate for LGBTQ rights and ensuring LGBTQ plus patients receive and have easy access to the highest quality mental health care. Joining them is Tiffany Myers, who is a licensed clinical social worker and the social work department chair at Nutria High School in Winneka, Illinois. She has 30 years of experience working in mental health and has spent the last 27 years counseling and learning from her students in a high school setting. She believes that all adolescents have unique stories and can thrive if they feel understood, accepted, and connected. Yay to that. Now let's welcome Melissa Blitz, Joe Sirio, and Tiffany Myers. Thank you, Lonnie. Um, I, I wanna thank Lonnie and Fan um, for providing this valuable resource to our community. Um, and really for giving me the opportunity to be a part of this important discussion. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so just to get us started, in, in my work uh, as a social worker in high schools, um, over the last 30 years, I, I've had a lot of opportunities to, to see students and sort of see the changing landscape of, you know, how um, how things have have evolved over the years, and and one of the things that's clear is that the culture around um, LGBTQ plus youth, when I first started, was one of secrecy and shame. And I think over time we're seeing more acceptance, but I'm still finding my students are um, experiencing a lot of stress um, around uh, around acceptance and being able to access their education because of some of the experiences they have throughout their day and the, the risk factors that, that impact them um, in their lives. And so, uh, Melissa and Joe, can you talk more about those risk factors? Yeah, absolutely. I can kick us off. And I, I also want to thank FAN for allowing us the platform to have this important discussion. An hour is a nice chunk of time. And, and the hope is that we get this conversation started and that it, it continues long after this event and that we plant some some helpful seeds. Um, in terms of risk factors, I think the the first three that that pop up right away that kind of encompass all of them are, are things like heterosexism, homophobia, and transphobia. Heterosexism being the belief that you know, the relationship between a man and a woman is seen as superior or normal or the only thing that is valued or accepted. And then homophobia and transphobia really being defined as the fear or exclusion of folks who identify as gay, trans, or anywhere on the sexual or gender minority spectrum, which we'll get into more detail about. Other factors that can kind of coexist with these three um, definitions are things like Religious extremism, where maybe within the, the doctrine or the rhetoric is um, some exclusion of these, these identity groups. Um, polarized cultural wars, which I think all of us are familiar with. Anything within the tapestry of our society that um, puts you know, sexual and gender minority folks up for debate and anything regarding our institutions, education, um, recreational activities, 
access to care, the list goes on and on. That leads right into legal hurdles that we see on a global spectrum, a national spectrum, and of course, state by state, um, and within that, even community by community. And then kind of zooming in a bit, there's, you know, there's all sorts of like messages that we hear and we have 24 at seven access to the news, whether it's on our TVs, our phones, push notifications, our tablets. And that can be a risk factor of where we get our information, what messages we're internalizing and what platforms we're turning to. Um, thinking about schools, we think about things like curriculum based learning and exclusion from curriculums like sex education or history curriculums. Um, there's always marginalization within the LGBTQ plus community, which can be a risk factor, as well as the influence of stereotypes and then general barriers to authenticity, um, which can have a direct link to our, our mental wellness and our mental health. And we'll, um, we'll talk more about that too. I, I think, you know, so one of the things that we've, you know, talked about a lot as a high school is this idea of windows and mirrors. And that, you know, being able to see people who are different than you through a window, seeing mirrors, seeing yourself, um, that that is something that is supportive and helps you feel comfortable and in your environment. When those things aren't in place and the factors that you were just talking about, Melissa, where you're constantly have, especially with social media and our kids are on their phones all the time and um, kind of coming at you and you're you're questioning the value of your identity or who you are. Like what kinds of risks are are the two of you seeing for for our youth? Sure, that's a great question. I can I can field that. Um, and first off, uh, I want to echo the sentiments of my 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 co panelists and thanking Fan for having this conversation. One of the things that that I'll talk to is how when I was uh, younger um, and uh, coming to terms with my own. Uh, sexual orientation, these types of conversations were not had. And so just the fact that we are given a platform to have an open discourse about gender identity, about sexual orientation, and about allyship is so important. Um, what we find, and I, I love that that imagery of, of windows and mirrors, but when when people do not see themselves in their communities, when they do not feel seen by others, um, it begin it, one, it's very isolating. Um, and you know, one of the things that makes uh, the LGBTQ plus community unique is that often, not always, but often, uh, we are coming of age in a home without queer role models that that most uh, gender nonconforming or transgender or gay, lesbian, bisexual individuals, have heterosexual parents and and cisgender parents, and as a result, they they don't have uh, mile markers. They don't have a, a frame of reference. It's very isolating, and it begins to over time erode at one's emotional well being. And so, what we see is increased rates of depression, increased rates of anxiety, increased rates of substance use, increased rates of eating disorders. Um, and, and sadly, uh, a significant increase in uh, the rates of suicide attempts. Uh, LGBTQ plus young people are three to four times more likely to attempt suicide than their cisgender heterosexual peers. Um, there are other risk factors as well uh, that uh, they are at greater risk of homelessness, um, either being evicted from their homes or or choosing to leave their homes because of non-acceptance, which then, of course, brings a whole realm of other risk factors, including victims of violence, uh, survival sex, and other types of exploitation that can occur out, uh, out and about. Um, but the other piece that I think is a little bit more insidious and sneaky is that general erosion of self that occurs as one begins to internalize uh, societal heterosexism and societal uh, homophobia and transphobia that that Melissa talked to, that um, over time it begins to permeate into who we are and gradually impacts our own behavior where we become our own worst enemies. We engage in self-defeating behavior. We engage in, in sabotaging behavior that only reinforces that sense that 
that I, as a member of the queer community, are, are, are less than or somehow flawed or broken. I do want to jump in here too and discuss just the importance of intersectionality when we're looking at these things and thinking about, and again, this is this is a discussion for, uh, this should be included in many discussions. And for today, thinking about someone being a part of more than one marginalized group. And so keeping that in mind as we're, as we're discussing that someone could be a member of the LGBTQ plus community and also be from another marginalized group. That is another ism in our society that can make things look very different. And so when we're talking about folks on the queer spectrum, thinking about that no two people who identify as LGBTQ are alike in their experience. And the notion of intersectionality is really important when we're thinking about this. Well, and I, I have so many questions that I have for the two of you as we're talking, but I think I want to pause a moment on something Joe said. And and those of us who, you know, kind of came of age in the 80s and 90s, um, the word queer was a bad word. You did not use it. It was disrespectful. And I think sometimes people, you know, in this parental age group um, aren't quite sure what to do with that word. Can you talk a little bit about um, the word queer and kind of the alphabet soup um, Sure. That, that I think can sometimes throw people off when they're trying to be supportive. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, uh, similarly, when I was coming of age, queer was offensive. It was a derogatory term uh, that at the time I would never think of using. Um, and at the time, it was the LGB community. And as as the community has grown and our own awareness has grown, we have added um, uh, or or um, acknowledged uh, members of the rainbow that is the LGBTQ plus community that weren't acknowledged earlier. Um, and LGBTQIAA plus is a mouthful sometimes. And so some people, uh, myself included, uh, may opt to reclaim the term queer um, as an umbrella term for anyone who is not or does not identify as as gender binary, cisgender, or heterosexual. Um, you may also hear people use, and I think Melissa used the term uh, earlier, um, gender and sexual minority. Um, and so you may hear us using them all interchangeably um, to reference members of members of our community. Um, we also have a definition sheet uh, that I believe there's a link to in the chat. Um, we could spend the entire hour we have together tonight talking about definitions and, and terms and the constantly evolving uh, awareness of different identities. Um, and we wouldn't get to the topic at hand, which is uh, resilience and allyship. So uh, please okay. reference that uh, as we go through tonight's talk. And so as I'm listening to the two of you talk about, you know, all of the risk factors and, and things that um, our youth can experience or that they're seeing um, through media. And, you know, I think there are external factors that we can talk about, but I think the internal factors are an important place to start. And, and this concept of resilience that you just mentioned. And can you talk a little bit about the importance of resilience and the impact it has um, on our youth? Sure. So, uh, I, I think I'd be remiss to so resilience uh, in its basic form is is uh, thriving in the face of adversity, and uh, I would be a, I would be um, a flawed ally if I didn't say it would be best if the world had no adversity. Um, sadly, that is that is not the case. That is not the world that we live in, um, and so while ongoing advocacy for a better tomorrow, for a better community, for a better world is important. Recognizing uh, we have to meet all of our young people where they're at, which is a flawed and imperfect world. So um, in that, uh, with that as the backdrop, um, adversity has two aspects. There is a the, the internal aspects that you mentioned, with ha which has to do with um, uh, some personality traits as well as skills and uh, tools that that people have to navigate their environment. But it also has to do with the supports and resources available to them in in their environment. Um, and that could be a supportive school district, 
like the one, I don't know, Tiffany, that you come from. Um, it could be um, a resource rich community in terms of mental health or a uh, fan as a resource to help foster ongoing education. Um, it could also be a community rich in allies and mentors, um, which is the the obviously the focus that we're going to place on this evening. And, and I think that, you know, we, we talk about those as kind of protective factors. That's usually the language we use in mm -hmm. the mental health business. And, and I think that the shorthand for that is um, our protective factors give us hope. Um, and that's often what allows people going through times of adversity um, to be able to, to get through. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about um, some ways that, that you've helped kids? I, I, I just constantly think of teenagers. So our youth kids um, see that hope with those protective factors. That's a really great question. There's so many avenues to go down. And I think what's important is that when you consider allyship is that you are instilling those protective factors within somebody else, you know, to know that there is at least one supportive relationship where you feel safe and heard and that there's trust can do a whole lot of good for our mental health. And so what's exciting about this conversation is talking about what are some steps in that direction? What are some actions that I can take to be an ally? I think something that I do, um, especially when working with patients who identify as LGBTQ+, is I come from a place of curiosity, and I also, I, I, I also come from a place of humility. Of even though I identify as a member of the community, and I, I at times disclose that when it's clinically indicated, that's a whole other conversation, and something that I, I do quite often. There's also um, there's also just that that humility of like I don't know your experience, I don't know how this impacts you within your family, within your community, within your school, within your alone time, how you spend your time privately, publicly, et cetera. And so just, just being open to learning and, and being mindful of any biases or judgments that arise in me um, and keeping those in check, but also being compassionate with myself that even though I am a member of the LGBT community, I have a lot of unlearning to do and a lot of, a lot of experience living in a heteronormative environment. Um, and so that's, that's a very, short answer for a very big question. Yeah, I I love that answer. Um, that, you know, understanding and delving into the uniqueness of everyone that we work with. And um, I might add on top of that, uh, building on the commonality, um, because it is such an isolating experience, uh, coming to terms with a gender identity or uh, sexual orientation, that you feel no one else could possibly understand, particularly in adolescence, when in general, that that sense of like, no one gets me uh, for for all of them. And, and then you add this as an added layer is letting them know that they are not um, that we have that we have our 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 different perspectives. And clearly, the journey that a young uh, person struggling with coming out today is going to be very different than my, you know, 1980s journey was um and um and there's things that we have in common there are things that they can learn uh and tap into the larger community and feel less alone and people who feel less alone are less likely to to uh engage in self-injury or suicidal behavior or substance use or some of those risk things that we talked about yeah. And I think the other piece that I'd like to add on, which Joe, thank you for reminding me, is like understanding if there are maladaptive behaviors or behaviors that aren't serving their wellness that may stem from some of these insecurities or fears is understanding, okay, what need are you trying to meet and how can I work with you to meet that very human need in a, in a healthier way? But again, coming at it with curiosity and, and being open to learning and saying that expressing my vulnerability of, I don't know what you're going through. And I'm, I'm so eager to learn. And if I mess up, if I mess up like your pronouns, or if I, if I, if I make an assumption, please tell me, because I really want to know if that happens. I mm -hmm. may not catch it first. Yeah. Well, I think one of the things I love about what you're saying is um, helping youth put language to their needs. Um, because I think a lot of times that is a challenge for them. They feel all the feelings. Um, they, you know, have have their all of their thoughts um, about 
you know, what they're experiencing. But a lot of times it's really hard to put that language out there. And just talking about giving kids strategies to find that language is really important. For sure. For sure. And, I, I, you know, words matter. And I know that we live in a culture where we are very thoughtful of how we speak, or some of us anyways, are very thoughtful of how we speak and what we say. And using that as a reason not to speak um, can lead us down the very wrong path that, um, as and Melissa said it so, so eloquently, that as long as I come from a place of curiosity and humility um, and saying, you know, I'm wondering this, I hope I didn't say that wrong. If I did, please correct me, um, is much better than saying nothing. And so, uh, you know, allyship, which we'll, you know, we'll talk about is scary. Mm -hmm. It's, it, it puts us, it, it's requiring us uh, to put ourselves out there and take risks and chances as an ally. Um, and uh, it requires uh, some commitment to, to put, to engage in some uncomfortable behaviors. Well, and it makes me think too, you know, I think that there are a lot of people who, you know, want to lead with kindness, want to be an ally, and they either see a public situation or find themselves in a private opportunity where they're observing something and they freeze mm -hmm. um, because they're just not quite sure what to say, what to do. They know in their head and their heart. So if we're talking again about the feelings and, and the thoughts, um, but it's hard to figure out what to do next. Can you talk a little bit about those moments and how meaningful they can be and and just kind of different things, different thoughts or questions people can ask themselves in that moment of freezing to help them move to the next step. This is such an important thing to talk about. And it's one of the most challenging because this is such a human experience of we notice something that is challenging or unhelpful or, or not supportive of a certain group of people that we care about. And we have that moment of like, oh, and the we have so many thoughts and emotions that steer us away from acting in line with allyship. And a lot of that has to do with these emotions that try to protect us from situations that may be difficult, like fear, insecurity, um, you know, bashfulness, even shame of speaking up in front of people that we may not do that around typically. And so I talk a lot about this with my patients when we're talking about, you know, engaging in new behaviors, because any new behavior is challenging. It's doing something different than what we're used to doing. And it sounds simple, but I always talk about like, think about the first time you tied your shoe. You were like maybe six years old. It took like every ounce of effort. You did the, the bunny ears and the loop and you had support. And now if I was like, hey, can you tie your shoe? You could do it with your eyes closed in maybe a third of a second. And so we need to acknowledge that being an ally is actively and intentionally going against the current of what our brain is going to pull us to do at first. And so part of this is being mindful of those urges to not act as an ally, which are very human and normal because it's we're not used to doing that. And intentionally recognizing it and choosing in spite of it so that we can help bring a marginalized community out of the margins and kind of put our privilege on hold and make that conscious choice. And it is going to be more difficult than not doing it. And still not doing something is still a choice. I think to add to that, if I may, but that um, there is no perfect way to be an ally. And so the fear that I might say or do something in a less than perfect manner, we're just going to take that and set that aside. Just as there is no perfect way to be gay or to be a transgender or to express any type of identity, there's no perfect way to ally and 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 we we get better as Melissa said with practice that I can almost now tie my shoes without thinking at 52. <laughs> um and so um don't let your fear of imperfection inhibit you because it is so it is so important. Um and it is oftentimes we don't have a sense of the impact that we have um, on the people that we are trying to be allies for. Um, I often, I often tell this story, um, uh, and I'd mentioned, you know, I, I grew up in the eighties, um, and things were very different then. the landscape was different. Um, it was kind of the, the peak of the AIDS crisis. And th as I mentioned, things weren't really discussed. And, um, I went to a conservative, uh, religious high school 
and uh, was in speech class where we had to uh, write and perform a commercial uh, for a made up product, a product of our imagination. Um, and one of my uh, peers, one of my students, <clears throat> thought it would be clever or funny to do a commercial for a product that he called Gay Away, which was like a spray on product of some type, kind of like Old Spice or whatever that you would put on and it would repel gay people. And um, and I will never forget this, that sitting and watching it, I could feel because I already knew that there was something different. I don't know that I had put a specific label on it, but hearing this, that kind of lump in your throat and that burning in your chest and uh, the instructor, uh, who to this day is a dear friend of mine, uh, stepped forward and was like, stop, we're not having this. Um, in addition to being the speech teacher, uh, she was the theater director and said, this is a community near and dear to my heart. I have lots of friends who identify as gay. I've lost friends to the AIDS epidemic and we will not have this there and sent the person to the principal's office and probably put her neck on the line. Uh, but I won't even tell you how many, but many years later, I still very much remember that as the first time that anyone stepped up and was an ally to me, not even knowing that I was in the, I mean, she knew I was in the room, she was my teacher, but didn't know how I identified or how I would come to identify as an adult. And um, it, it's a, I hold that up all the time as a, a, an excellent example of, she didn't even know that she was being an ally and she was being an ally um, as well as an incredible friend. Well, and I, and I think sometimes too, I mean, and, and that's a great example of someone who just, you know, kind of got after it as an ally right in that moment. And, and it also makes me think about sometimes it's also can be as someone who's kind of getting their legs under them um, with being an ally, just to say, this doesn't feel right to me. Just putting language to exactly what is going on in your head, even though you can't find the right words to say um, to help, you know, really show your support yeah. and show that you do not agree with what's happening. Right. And, just a little like time out, time out. What's happening here? And right. in that moment, if you are not able to do a time out, because those those barrier emotions can be so strong, it can be something you revisit the next day. It can be something you revisit the next week. It doesn't have to be in that moment. Like Joe said, there's no perfect ally. And if you are committed to kind of elevating, standing up for the LGBTQ community and pointing out when something isn't affirming, whether someone's conscious of it or not, doesn't have to be right in that moment. Um, you can still honor that commitment at, at any time. When you have time for those emotions to, to taper off and you have time to think through how you want to respond, which is extremely hard, if not impossible to do in that, that instant moment, you first hear a comment. You know, and I've had um, teachers come to me before and say, you know, a student has pro uh, approached me. They've divulged something about their identity and I don't quite know what to do. Um, and, you know, I, I first start by saying they've chosen you mm -hmm. um, because you've mm -hmm. sent out some signals that let them know that you are a person they can talk to. And, you know, let's think through how to proceed. But I guess I'm curious if we could talk a little bit more about um, some of the things that lead to the signals. Um, mm -hmm. What are what things are people doing that give off that vibe that um, allows a young person to take the chance um, and be vulnerable and you know put a piece of themselves in into a public venue that where they want to talk about some part of who they are. I think, I mean, there's many ways. There again, there's no one pathway through allyship. Um, but I, I would say one, inclusivity um, in any way, shape or form sends that message, whether it is the language that you use or the, if you're a classroom teacher, for example, um, the artwork that mm -hmm. you uh, that you hang in terms of like, if there's pictures of families in your classroom, what do those families look like? Um, if you include uh, LGBTQ plus facing uh, curriculum, and whether it's uh, history or literature or um, or political science or whatever whatever coursework uh, you're you're teaching, um, 
It is how you ask questions and how you address them and checking your own heteronormative assumptions. Um, and it's hard. It's hard. I was I was talking with someone um, uh, the other day who said something very benign about like, oh, I was working with this couple and the male in the couple, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, as if there could only be one male in the couple. And this was a, a peer that I would say is very well educated, um, but it just slips out. It just slips out. And so, um, and, and, and I think they saw my, my eyebrow go like, mm. and we're like, oh, what I meant is, and I'm like, perfect, perfect. You know, um, so those are some ways uh, that I think we can create the space, if you will, uh, that would allow someone to approach us and say, I need your help. Or can you do you have a minute to listen? I agree with that. I would add to it and just say that inclusive language. Um, it, it, it's it's hard to plug in because we a lot of us grew up with a very dichotomous language, you know, boys and girls, please line up, you know, we thought of marriage in terms of a man and a woman for a very long time until it was, you know, in, at least in this country, um, legally accepted. And still that's, that's less than 10 years ago. Um, things of that nature to start. I'd say the, the first thing is to practice inclusive language. I always say there's no disadvantage. You know, if I were to say so-and-so sibling instead of sister or brother, or walk, when I walk into a room and we're introducing myself, say, like, Hey, I'm Melissa. I use she, her pronouns. Even if no one else did, that sends a signal that I'm, I am aware um, about the importance of, of sharing my pronouns and being open to hearing other, other folks' pronouns. Um, and also just practicing that language. Um, it, it's, it's tough and it takes a lot of intention. We're not, it's different than how we normally speak where we're not always very mindful and things just roll off the tongue. And if we, if we are being committed to being allies, just being mindful that the language that's inclusive isn't necessarily the language that we've been practicing for many, many years. Um, and I also agree with Joe. I mean, I think some visuals can always be helpful. And just when you're describing certain things, being aware of is there what's the most inclusive way that I can describe something or approach a conversation? And also the questions we ask people. Can I ask, like, who, if I were to ask a question in a certain way or demonstrate a topic, are, are there any people that I'm leaving out? And if so, how can I course correct? And there's times that I think you can be very strategic. Um, for example, if if I'm working with someone and, and clinicians are notorious, therapists are notorious for um, boundary conversations and, you know, not not bringing their personal life into sessions. However, if um, if I'm trying to establish a safe space for a patient or a student or whomever that I'm working with that I suspect needs an ally, I will intentionally say husband mm -hmm. and not partner or spouse to let them know like, hey, you know, this is a place where you can bring those concerns. Um, and if it's someone that I know well, that I have a relationship with, sometimes I will ask pointed questions like, is everything okay? I have questions about this, but can, is it okay if I ask you instead of waiting for them to come mm -hmm. to me? Um, because oftentimes that's, that's all they have are people waiting, waiting for kids to come out, waiting for them to identify and they're too anxious. And so sometimes, again, it, you have to have that relationship with them, but sometimes being the one to approach them and say, is there anything that you need to talk about? Um, it is what it takes to prime the pump. Mm -hmm. That's a really important point. That's a really important point is sometimes we have this default setting of, you know, when someone's ready to talk, they'll talk to me. And that's not always the case. It's it's hard to think about what does ready look like and to demonstrate, you know, I am someone who who is safe and is eager to learn and is curious and is mindful of judgments. And I want to and I want to be there for you. I want to help elevate you. You know, the courage piece is maybe taking that first step rather than waiting for someone to step towards you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, years ago during my my coming out journey, um, I had a, a good friend who was upset that I had not come out to them sooner, um, to the point that they were they were angry, um, and, and kind of backed me into a corner where I was forced to say, "You never asked. You like where where was that question? You just assumed 
And so don't be angry at me. I brought this to you when I was ready. If you had concerns, you should have asked about that. Well, and 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 I think too that sometimes the the priming the pump as you, as you describe it um, can be something that you know the the timeline is each person's timeline for how they want to share. Um, mm -hmm. Because I remember a time of having a student that was a freshman, and I kind of wondered and asked some questions, kind of around the edge, um, trying to be respectful and not you know kind of put put something an identity on someone that they had not shared with me. Um, and having the student not share anything and then find me in the hallway two years later mm. and say, Hey, can I talk to you? What you were sort of hinting at with me is something that I wasn't comfortable talking about at that time, but I really need someone to talk to right now. Um, and how those just establishing, establishing yourself as an ally can be really valuable. Um, and it just may not because we're ready for someone to to be ready to talk to us about whatever it is um, may not mean they're ready. Mm -hmm. Correct. And I think I think that's really important. It's a, um, timing is everything and particularly timing when it comes to safety. Um, and oftentimes, particularly young, eager allies that, that are like, oh, great, let's talk about how to come out to your parents and but like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Um, let's assess. Let's be thoughtful of the environment. Let's be thoughtful of what the consequences are. Um, and there are some instances that I actually counsel young people against coming out if they feel that there's a potential for rejection or worse or you know abuse or homelessness. Like that's the beauty of waiting sometimes till college. Like you're out of the house and you're independent and free from at least some of the potential harsh realities of having an unaffirming a uh, parent or guardian. And that all comes back to the curiosity and the humility of being an ally is, is before jumping to conclusions or even being, a, is first being aware of, am I jumping to conclusions is, is learning from, from who you're speaking to and gathering the context and what someone's lived experience is like, so that you can, you can partner with them in navigating in a healthy way versus thinking about like almost like a prescription of like what you think someone should do. Right. And I think a lot of us are guilty of that, especially when we care deeply about somebody is the shoulds and the have you tried and, and those types of sentence starters. Right. And there's no recipe for a person. <laughs> no. Although, you know, if there was a recipe, the first ingredient is safety and protection. Mm -hmm. um, the rest, you know, is seasoned to taste, if you will. But um, <laughs> safety and protection uh, of the person and of yourself as an ally. We don't want any of our allies putting themselves in harm's way either. Um, but but that has to be the foundation for good allyship. Well, and as you bring up the, the, the idea of, you know, putting yourself in harm's way, I think one thing that I've observed, you know, is with being an ally, people can be afraid of, you know, being canceled, of saying the wrong thing, of making a mistake. And and yet I've found that many of the students that I've worked with who identify as LGBTQ plus uh, give me a great deal of grace mm -hmm. um, that I make mistakes. I say the wrong thing and they so gently and kindly um, course correct me um, in a way that I think just builds a relationship. And I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about those so sort of bookends of being afraid that you're going to um, be you know, socially ostracized because you said the wrong thing versus building these relationships that give you an opportunity to make a mistake and have kindness in a relationship where you're really working toward um, respect, mutual respect. That's what makes this conversation so rich and what makes it so challenging is that there's fear on both sides. There's fear of uncertainty on both sides. The person who's part of the LGBTQ spectrum kind of sharing their truth, there's uncertainty of like, once this is out, I don't know how this person's going to respond. I don't know if I have the same, if the same degree of safety that I feel now, not being as open and or as vulnerable. And the person hearing the information is like, well, what if I say the wrong thing back? What if I hurt feelings? What if I get canceled? And so there's this like tough uncertainty barrier that both people face. And we know one thing our brain hates is not knowing the outcome of what's going to happen. We don't like vulnerability. No, no. Or, or uncertainty. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, the other thing that I would say, and you know, if you've ever um, followed someone on social media, a celebrity or an athlete um, or politician who has come out and identified and then read the comments and and most of the comments in social media, of course, are going to be like, good for you and congratulations. But there are the trolls out there who will post terrible, terrible things. And that's the fear that young LGBTQ plus people have. So what you are going to say will not be the terrible things that they're hearing on social media or that they hear in, in locker rooms or that they hear in whatever. It may be less informed than it could be. But as long as you approach it from a place of, of gentleness, curiosity, humility, and support, it will always be the right thing to say. It, it might be righter the next time, <laughs> but it will always be the right thing to say. And there's that vulnerability word that I think is really important to, to be aware of is, is to even demonstrate, like it's possible to say like, hey, I am so committed to being there for you. And I'm also worried about like messing up and 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 I just want you to know that like I deeply care and I might mess up and like I'm I'm really open to continuing to learn. So please don't take me messing up is that I'm not supportive of you and I want to and I want to make sure that that I learn from this and that I'm I'm communicating in a way that that I'm intending to. Yeah. I'm doing the best that I can. Doing in the best that I can. Yeah. Yeah. And I think and just listening to the two of you talk too, I it also made me think about parents mm -hmm. and the vulnerability of sending this person that you love out into the world. You know, you're talking about the comments. That's what made me think about it. The comments on social media and just desperately wanting to bubble wrap your child. What what advice do you have for parents um, who want to love and protect their child, but also, you know, they have to exist in the world? That's a great question. and. Um, you know, there are times that I am grateful that I, um, am old enough that, uh, I don't have children. It wasn't a, it wasn't a, a reality when I was young enough to consider fatherhood that it just wasn't a, a thing that people did, um, because it is a scary place out there. Um, and I think the, you know, the anecdote for hateful speech or worse yet, hateful behavior is love. And that, you know, at the risk of sounding like a, a greeting card or a warm fuzzy t-shirt, like that's the best thing that you can do as a parent is shower your child with love um, and ensure them that you are safe, that your home is safe. And um, and I, I I can think of several people in my life who, who exemplify this, like let your 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 mama bear papa bear however you identify bear come out when you see your child being treated poorly and be the advocate that they need you to be be the ally that they need you to be and and raise them to um to be their own best ally and to be allies for other people i mean because one of the things that i think um we want out of this discourse this conversation is not just adult allies, but the next generation of allies as well, as well that you don't need to be raising an LGBTQ plus uh, child to teach these concepts in your home. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, and so the other day I was outside and, you know, this group of teenage boys pulled up in a car and my elderly neighbor was shoveling her driveway and they all jumped out and went to help her and shovel. And that, you know, clearly there was something taught there around supporting elderly people, helping them out, being respectful. And can you just talk a little bit about what that's like to intentionally raise our youth to be allies um, for our LGBTQ plus community? Because we do it in other areas. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and yet I don't know that we're intentional in this area. It's a really good question. Well, I am in a place where I am a new parent. I have a little baby at home and my wife and I are very cautious about making sure that we're not 
reading books or using language, even at this point, that is um, narrow and isn't inclusive. And my hope is that this next generation grows up where it is normal. It, they are accustomed to seeing families that look different than necessarily just a, a husband and a wife and some kids. Um, they, they are they are used to hearing pronouns being introduced. They have friends that span the gender spectrum and the and the sexuality spectrum, and that this language is something they grow up with versus something we have to intentionally put on and practice. And I think, you know, there is responsibility on the parent for just committing to that and having open dialogue. And, and also, like, even if your child doesn't identify as someone on the LGBTQ spectrum, which is probable, they likely will have friends or acquaintances that do. And so being inquisitive about, well, what is the experience of your friend or how are you supporting your friend or how can I support, you know, when your friend cr comes over to hang out? I mean, all of that is going to be part of the landscape. What's also going to be part of the landscape are like how this has become so politicized and how this has become so intertwined in our in our legal paradigm in, in this country and, and the uncertainty of I don't know where that's going to land and being open to educating and, and having those discussions um, and and knowing that those discussions are welcomed in the house. Well, and and just speaking of discussions being politicized, I think I think that can be one of our most challenging things that we are in this, you know, very right and wrong, black and white um, point in our in our country and conversations that we're having, and just being able to have those conversations. What advice do you have for teachers, parents, um, for embracing that, leaning into it, and also not stepping on landmines? Yeah, I think I think where the politics oftentimes come into it is when we over-sexualize the discussion. Um, and like, oh, they're too young to understand what it means to be gay. Like, are they? Um, because we're not talking about sex acts. Um, you know, that's that's a completely uh, inappropriate conversation for baby Dawson or, uh, you know, a six year old or, or whatnot. But saying some some couples are, you know, a man and woman or some kids have two moms or some people don't identify as either a man or a woman. Kids will get that. You know, it is not an inappropriate conversation. I think oftentimes that's where parents struggle. That's where schools struggle sometimes is worried uh, at some objection that we're talking too young or with kids that are too young about sex. And I can have a very meaningful conversation about my relationship with my husband without disclosing anything about what happens in our bedroom. Mm -hmm. And so I think sometimes, you know, as people are working to become allies, they are, you know, looking for resources. Where is something I can read, something I can look at, something I can, that will help me crystallize my thoughts, you know, really plan my intentions. In what direction would you point people to help them find, you know, of course, you could replay this fan talk off YouTube, but um, other places you would direct them just to help them kind of do some thinking about um, moving in a direction to be an ally, to be a support. I think there's a ton of resources out there. I think that's also part of the challenge is where do I start? Um, we did include some resources um, that are within the chat. And so it's it's agencies, some, some national, some local, that um, that help the LGBTQ community. And within those websites, there's usually an information page. That's a good place to get started. Additionally, within those um, resource pages, these, these have additional resource pages attached. And so you'll get into kind of a tunnel of resources, but all have been like vetted um, and are all helpful. I think also being cautious of where you pull your information and making sure that it is reputable and, and helpful. Um, because as we know with the ever growing internet, um, some of that information is is not helpful and doesn't come from a um i would say like well well informed well, well researched place good point um i think as well um what what i would encourage parents to do is is 
seek out other parents, you know, or with teachers seek out other teachers that if I'm trying to develop myself as an ally, find other allies. Um, it is, it, it is not as, as difficult as it, it would seem, um, you know, for, uh, PFLAG, for example, parents and friends of lesbians and gays, which is a much narrower term than, than, uh, what our society needs now, but that is an organization for parents to reach out and support each other. Uh, GLSEN is the organization for educators who want to be allies. So there's there's lots of, of resources out there, but I think talking to other allies and learning from them and learning from their mistakes so that um, I learned, that, oh, this is the a better way to ask that question or whatnot could be incredibly helpful. And I think that that's a really helpful, it's just helpful to have like a, just a path to go down some, some place to, you know, just gather more information and, and help. Because I think one of the things that happens is that, you know, uh, there's a lot of good intention around being an ally. And if we're not intentional about thinking about it more often than every once in a while, um, we just aren't able to demonstrate those sort of ally skills <laughs> at the same level as if, if we're making a commitment to just continually educate ourselves, continually gather information and practice. Um, yeah. it, it does. It takes practice and it takes work. It is, it is not a simple decision like boink. Now I'm an ally. <laughs> um, there, there's some heavy lifting involved in it. And there's many, there's many avenues to take, you know, you can commit to, I want to practice, you know, two examples of inclusive language and really commit to that. It can be committing to a cause that has to do with legal, institutional, societal change. It can do with committing to a conversation with somebody where um, you, you know you could learn from them. It could be asking more inclusive questions where maybe our urge is to steer away from those questions because we may, we may assume or, or hold the belief that they're sensitive or it's inappropriate or someone should come to me and maybe start gently challenging those assumptions. It can, it can take all forms. Um, and I do, I do, I can very much understand, you know, where do I start? And I, I very much encourage like, choose one avenue, practice it, see how it feels, go from there, because we don't want this to feel like an assignment or a burden. This is hopefully an empowering option that we all have at any moment. Well, and one thing I've learned over time, just working with our youth is that, um, especially like with teachers, a lot of teachers have, you know, really great intentions. Like they want to be very supportive of their students in all the best ways, but often don't have the language. And so you just mentioned um, inclusive questions. Can you just talk through a few of those inclusive questions? Because I think sometimes just hearing them is like, a, oh, yeah, I can do that. Um, more so than, you know, having the concept and then trying to generate your own question. Sure. So um, are you asking someone to prom as opposed to is there a girl you're asking to prom or are there a, is there a boy you want to ask you to prom? Um, are you dating anyone? Um, or, and, and I think Melissa said this, like, hi, you know, I'm Joe, I'm going to be your algebra teacher this year. I use he, him pronouns. That would be a terrifying experience. I would love to learn way. math from Joe. <laughs> <laughs> no one wants that. <laughs> but, um, you know, and I use he, him pronouns. Um, that, you know, something just as simple as that sets the stage for, I don't use he, him pronouns. I prefer they. Um, and uh, or someone might say, why did you say that? In which case I can educate someone who doesn't know about pronouns, you know, that some people don't use pronouns that match what you would think in terms of how they present or how they look. And I think those are help those are helpful things just to move people on their journey. And and I think I imagine that there are a lot of people listening right now who are in very different places in, in their journey as an ally. Um, or as a you know young person or an adult uh, who identifies as LGBTQ+, and thinking that through um, can be really helpful. I guess I, I'm wondering if there are any nuggets um, or pieces of information that I haven't asked you about that you're like, ooh, I wish you'd ask a question, and I haven't asked the right question. I'd love to, I'd love to hear what you have to say. 
I have one thing just to tack on in the very limited time we have. And again, this is this is planting the seeds of a, of a very, this is an ongoing discussion for all of us. And I'm again, really grateful for the opportunity um, is to just be on the lookout for nonverbals. You know, we talk about how coming out is a verbal process. It is challenging. It 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 is on someone's own timeline for many, many variables that, that, that influence someone to come out or, or to not. And if you notice changes in somebody's behavior, um, if you notice things that promote anxiety that maybe didn't used to, be curious. Hey, I noticed that you're not as talkative when we go to family events. Am I missing something? Is there something you'd like to talk about? I'm all ears. I notice when grandma discusses your cousin dating, you've tended to leave the table. I'm I'm curious, like I, I just want to learn more. I'm noticing differences. And just to be on the lookout, because as much as a lot of this conversation is dialogue, there are nonverbals that can maybe clue us in that someone may need some more support or missing a piece of the puzzle. A really great point. Because I think that, that those just noticing is always um, a way to invite conversation. Mm. Uh, boy, Tiffany, Melissa, Joe, what a fabulous, fast-paced, open-hearted, smart, insightful, resourceful, useful conversation. I'd probably have a few more adjectives somewhere <laughs> in the back room. I'll pull them out in a minute. Thank you so much. I want to acknowledge Tiffany. Thank you so much. Uh, Nutria High School has been a fan, partner of FAN for decades. Thank you so much for what is decades of service on your part to the school and to its students. They're very lucky to have you. You you it's clear you prepared so carefully for this tonight and we really appreciate that especially because we know how busy you are so thank you so much for that and melissa and joe compass health center uh, we have been partnered with compass since the day they opened uh, maybe even a little bit before that um, we uh, very much value the relationship with both uh, david schreiber claudia welke the co-founders of compass um, thank you so much for again out of your busy schedules uh, really putting a lot of heart and thought into the content tonight, preparing the definitions document, preparing the resource document, your whole team getting together and helping uh, give people as much information as possible is such a boon to the community to have both this opportunity. It's great that it's going to live on video for folks. Thank you so much for some of your time tonight. So I just want to put all that right out to you. We have about two minutes here. I'm going to jump into a question. Um, that I, it's kind of speaking to my heart here a little bit is from Jacqueline uh, that was submitted tonight. She says, <clears throat> my child identifies as they, them pronouns and is very private. And I want to talk to them about it so I understand more. Any guidance you can give me to open up the dialogue to be more specific, they have told me, and yet I am not able to ask questions to understand what they are feeling. And I know they think of me as an ally. So I think the question, if I'm understanding it correctly, I think the question is she's seeking advice for herself, how she can, it's not so much about drawing the child out, it is about how she can perhaps crack open a little bit more towards the child, if I'm reading it right. And I could be maybe not reading it right, but I think that's what she means. So I, I think there's a few things that I, I, I could recommend. I mean, I, the first and foremost is, is um, making sure that the child knows the door is open. So that whenever you need me, whether it's to listen or to answer questions or to step up and advocate for you if you're having difficulties, all you need to do is ask and I am here. Um, and then start, you know, one of the things that I always remind kids is when they choose to identify to their parents, um, that's often not the start of that, that teenager's journey but it is the start of the parent's journey in many of those times. And so start that journey with eagerness in terms of what do I need to do? What work as the parent do I need to do to check my own isms and beliefs so that I can be the best parent I can be for this young person? I do appreciate that. Melissa, did you wanna add any other point to that as we close out? I don't, I agree with that. I think if the it is up to the child, you know, we, the, the parent can unlock the door. It's the child's decision whether to open the door or not. And in the meantime, it can only help to educate, to talk to others and to be as prepared and open and kind and, and ready for that conversation as you can be when that door does open. Great. I wanna uh, remind all those who are attending that we will be sending out the recording link through the Zoom platform, usually within a day or two. We'll include uh, some of the links that we've been putting in chat. You'll have the links to the documents, 
all of that will be there. There were a couple of folks who, when they registered, were wondering if they were getting CEUs uh, for attending. This is not aimed at clinicians, it's aimed at the general public, so the answer is no to that. Um, but we want to thank everyone for attending. Thank you so much. It's really important, great work, and we're glad to be partners with all of you on putting it forward. So thank you so much for your time tonight. We're very grateful.